Um, the aim of L LBT Women's Health Week is to raise awareness about lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and queer women's health inequalities, to make it easier for service providers to empower service users and for communities to support LGBTQ women. Now, up front, I will declare an interest as a lesbian who also suffers from anxiety and other mental health issues. I know my own experiences uh, have taught me a huge amount and recent months and years of reflection since I came out in 2015, um, I have had a little bit of time, despite the political uh, storms that we have lived through in recent years, uh, to reflect on some of the reasons uh, why it took me so long to come out. But I am very grateful to the Backbench Business Committee for granting this debate and to the many charities and organisations who operate in the LGBTQ space, <coughs> who have provided briefings today, to our healthcare professionals, who I know we will discuss today, but who we must pay tribute to, to the Women and Equalities Committee and the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, who I know have done much work and produced reports uh, that many of us will draw on today. I know there will be some controversial issues discussed today, but I am certain that we will hold this debate and have our discussions with respect and integrity. I also want to thank the many folk who contacted me after I put a shout out on social media asking for uh, lesbian, bisexual and transgender women's experiences of health inequality. Now, I'm sure that everybody in this House will agree on the ills of social media, but I also hope that we can agree that there are times when it can be incredibly positive and constructive, a tool for us to engage. At a time when this Parliament and the politics of this place can seem very far from folks' lives, I have appreciated the ability to reach out to the public via Twitter and other social media channels, and I will shortly share some of the experiences that members of the public have shared with me on this issue. Some of them, I know, were very painful and very difficult to relive and recount. And the truth is, Madam Deputy Speaker, there are many facets to the discussion and debate on health care of LGBTQ people and women in the LGBTQ community. And I think the fact there is a specific week to raise awareness when there are so many other issues going on is really helpful. Because the Science and Technology Committee report states there is emerging evidence demonstrating that lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and other minority sexuality gender identity groups experience significant health inequalities across their lifespan, often starting at a young age. And as I said, as someone who came out literally as I was being elected um, to myself, I came out initially and then later to my family and friends and publicly some time after that, that was challenging. And it is fair to say that the impact on my mental health was profound. There was not exactly, as most of us who have been here since 2015 will know, time to process any personal challenges or issues. Um, but my experience of certainly coming out publicly was a hugely positive one, and social media played a part in that. Taking part in a, in a photograph of LGBTQ MPs and peers, which then went online and attracted much attention, showed the solidarity uh, not just in this place and at the time in the other place for LGBT politicians, but across wider society. It was a hugely positive thing. But I am also very, very conscious that I had an incredibly supportive network of family and friends, and also that I have a very privileged position. And in many ways, I came out with the cover of political privilege. That is something that very, very few other people across the UK and beyond have. And we must always remember the challenges that folk across the UK and beyond face in coming out and the many countries where it is still illegal and people are persecuted for being LGBTQ. Would the Honourable Member take I'd be happy to give on that very point? Um, does the Honourable Member feel that at this time we should include in our thoughts those lesbian, bi and trans women who are asylum seekers and have been asked by this government to prove that? I thank the, the Honourable Lady for her intervention and I absolutely agree with what she is saying and, and there are a number of stories in the press at the moment about LGBT asylum seekers that are hugely concerning 
And I would like to think that, given the distance that we have travelled, um, that this government will review the processes and the policies that, that it has and look very, very carefully about the treatment of LGBT asylum seekers. I have met a number of them myself, and there is some incredibly important work ongoing. But stories that we are reading in the press and the experiences that we are hearing of LGBT asylum seekers is deeply troubling, and I absolutely agree uh, with what she is saying. Now, for anybody coming out a bit later in life, I, I discovered recently that um, middle age is being classed between 30 and 50. I have to say that was a <laughs> shocking discovery. Um, I, you know, there are, that's middle youth. That's middle youth, as my, my honourable my honourable friend says, and I would I would absolutely agree with that. There is, for many people, and there was for me, an element of regret and in, and in fact mourning. Uh, for a life not lived as your authentic self. And it's hard to describe what that feels like. Um, I try very hard to look forward, to make the most of what's in front of me, not to look back and have regrets that I wasn't living my life uh, as, as, my, as my true self. And there are many reasons why people come out later in life. And there is also much research around the profound impact that that has on people's mental and physical health. It can be coming out as lesbian, gay or bisexual can be a very different experience uh, from coming out as trans. I can't imagine how, how incredibly difficult that is, particularly in the current climate. Yeah, yeah. But we owe it to our trans and non-binary citizens to support them and ensure that debate and discussion or in changes in legislation or any uh, matters relating to their lives and their health care is conducted in a respectful and decent way. And sadly, I think we can all agree that there are times recently that that has not happened and is not happening at present. Um, would my honourable friend agree that while it now seems to be socially unacceptable to express anti-gay uh, thoughts and feelings, by contrast, we appear to now be having an open season on trans people, and it's deplorable. And does she agree with me that it must be deeply disturbing? for young trans people who are trying to come to terms with who they are. I thank my honourable friend for that intervention, and, and, and I would absolutely agree with them. And whilst discussions about technical details of legislation and concerns that people may have you know, uh, can and should be discussed, they have to be dis discussed in a respectful way. And the open season, as he says, on trans people, and some of the rhetoric that, that you could literally cut and paste from the 80s mm. and the 70s that was used against um, lesbian and gay and bi people now being used against trans Toilet people is, is, is just utterly deplorable, as he says. And, and we must do everything we can to protect <coughs> trans and non-binary people's rights and indeed their mental health. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, we know the LGBT community, in, including lesbian, bi and trans women, experience significant health inequalities and specific barriers uh, to services and support. Stonewall Scotland's survey of LGBT people in Scotland found that half of LGBT people have experienced depression in the last year, including seven in ten trans people. More than half of trans people have thought of taking their own life in the last year. And let's just reflect on that. Half of trans people have thought of taking their own life in the last year. So when we think about the debate that is currently ongoing and when we reflect on that, we must look at that statistic and take it very, very seriously. Happy to give way. Thank you so, so much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Lady for giving way. When you say half of trans, trans people, can you say, put a figure on that? Because I, I would like to know that, because it's terribly sad. Um, um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. What the the, the st statistics that are within that uh, Stonewall Scotland report are, are specific to Scotland, so that's 52 per cent. I don't have the exact numbers, but I would be very happy to get those and to share those with uh, the right honourable gentleman. But it's, it's a significant number. Um, and one in six LGBT people have deliberately harmed themselves in the last year. One in four LGBT people have witnessed discriminatory or negative remarks against LGBT people by healthcare staff. One in eight LGBT people have received unequal treatment 
um, in the healthcare system because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. And almost two in five trans people have avoided healthcare treatments for fear of discrimination. One in four LGBT people have experienced healthcare staff having a lack of understanding of specific lesbian, gay and bi health needs. And nearly three in five trans people have experienced healthcare staff having a lack of understanding of specific trans health needs. Now, I understand that some of these matters are very technical and they are challenging and it requires a level of expertise. That is why education and open discussion and proper resourcing in Scotland and across the UK is absolutely vital. And we know how incredibly hard staff in the NHS work in all countries and parts of the UK. We salute them. However, these studies do show that there is a bit more work to be done. And I want to share some of the experiences that a number of um, lesbian, bisexual and trans women have been kind enough to contact me and offer. Their very personal experiences and perspectives are invaluable. And it's right today in this debate that we give them a voice. One trans woman who transitioned a number of decades ago in another country, but now lives in the UK, contacted me with her experience. She says, almost all of my medical appointments have been for general medical issues. The only time I've seen anyone in the GIDS pathway was once I had a consultation with a surgeon uh, regarding a long-term consequence of the particular type of gender reassignment surgery I had, which was satisfactorily resolved. She mentioned issues with access to drugs, but that was not necessarily about her being trans, but about two health boards in England not speaking to each other, and that was resolved. All of these appointments, she said, were handled in a very courteous, respectful and professional manner. However, she says, I suspect the combination of my age, the length of time since my transition and especially my professional status may have afforded me a certain degree of privilege. I'm not certain that others, particularly younger trans women or those who are just beginning transition, would necessarily have the same experience. She says, although, interestingly, all of her doctors have been aware of her transgender status as it affects some aspects of her medical care, no doctor has ever inquired about her sexuality or whether she is sexually active. It may be useful to know um, her, her registration as a clinical and forensic psychologist. She's a, a long-time member of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, an affiliate member of the British Association of Gender Identity Specialists and a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Transgender Health. She has been a full-time faculty member at many universities and is, by all accounts, it would be fair to say, an expert uh, in her field. Um, I, um, my hon. Friend has, has passed me a little note there on, on some of the numbers. And uh, just to go back to the right hon. Gentleman's point, uh, there are up to half a million trans people in the UK. That's <coughs> according to the Government Equalities Office. So if you break those numbers down in terms of Scotland's population and a percentage, that's a significant number of people being affected and considering taking their own lives. So I think the serious of of that uh, is very important, and I thank my honourable friend for that, that wee, uh, wee bit of information there. Um, the, the, the woman who got in touch with me advises that she was recently offered a position as a psychologist at a specialist clinic in the UK. Good news, I would say, given the expertise that she has. There were a number of reasons, though, why she declined the position. But in her own words, she says, the most important reason why I declined the position, however, was the horrendous amount of transphobia currently rampant in the UK, spurred on by what seems to be an ever-growing number of highly inaccurate, one-sided or genuinely bigoted and hateful articles and columns in the press. I felt that to be a trans woman working um, within, the get, within the GIDS would place me directly in the firing line of a barrage of hatred and abuse, something which, honestly, I was not willing to endure. Those are the words of someone who is highly professional with specialist training that I imagine the NHS would have been hugely fortunate to have. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, that's the lived experience of a trans woman in our society and should give us all pause for thought and reflection. Because the reality of not being properly fully funded uh, of these services was highlighted to me by another person who contacted me, where they raised the issue of the very long wait list to access services in the Gender Identity Development Services. Uh, known as GITS. They explained to me that the very long two-plus years between referral and first appointment, leaving hundreds of children and adolescents in distress for extended periods, 
The UK Government promised an inquiry into the massive increase uh, of referrals, but it appears to have vanished. Um, these young people are in desperate need of better care, but are being ignored. GIDS say that they should be treated under Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, known as CAMS, in the interim, but for the most part CAMS won't touch them once gender identity issues are mentioned. Now, they advise that they are lucky enough to afford private therapy, um, but the children's GIDS service is failing and should form part of your debate. So I hope that the Minister will consider those matters and perhaps be able to update um, not only in the Chamber, but perhaps in writing, so I may be able to share that uh, with that person who got in touch with me. Madam Deputy Speaker, in terms of gender recognition legislation and, and why it is needed, I was struck by a contribution and a podcast um, by Time for Inclusive Education. They have created a podcast <coughs> called Tie Talks, and it's well worth a listen. And Riddle Wadwa, a, a trans woman of colour uh, who lives in Scot and works in Scotland, recently spoke alongside Sharon Cowan, Professor of Feminist and Queer Legal Studies from Edinburgh, uh, on their podcast. They spoke compellingly about the Gender Recognition Act and the impact of the current system on the mental and physical health of trans people. And I would urge people to listen to that because it is hugely informative. I would like to pay tribute to Jordan Daly and Liam Stevenson, who founded TAI, and their chair, Rhiannon Spear, who do remarkable work in Scotland for young people around LGBT education. Now, Mriddle spoke about the patriarchal nature of the Gender Recognition Panel and how a group of anonymous people are deciding your future and fate in a way that echoes and has parallels, in her view, with the immigration system, which she has direct experience of. I was interested in hearing more about that and had a discussion with her about the differences and parallels of coming out as trans versus coming out as lesbian, gay or bi. Now, she came out uh, and, and transitioned in a different country, but she was clear that there are inherent similarities. And I certainly remember when I came out, people saying to me, well, you can look forward to coming out every day. And I have to say that is pretty true and, and still nearly five years on. Um, but what she told me was, as a trans person, there are so many hurdles to overcome and at times she feels uh, that she feels you, you're having, how many people do you need to convince that you are a man or a woman? Now, I can't imagine, Madam Deputy Speaker, what that's like, having to justify your very existence repeatedly. It must be exhausting and taking a huge, huge toll, as we've seen from the statistics, on someone's mental and physical health. Now, back in 2013, there was a study in the US that said, unsurprisingly, uh, legalising gay marriage may improve health and reduce healthcare costs. Another similar study last year found that legalising equal marriage can, imp can improve the mental health of same-sex couples. Wow, what a revelation. You can marry the person that you love and live the life that you, uh, that you want to as the person you are, and it might actually make you happy, and it might reduce the burden on the healthcare system. I'd be happy. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank the member very much for giving away. Can I also thank every single member of this House who did the work that couldn't be done uh, in Northern Ireland to ensure that uh, our brothers and sisters were uh, fully entitled to full equality uh, in, in the place uh, where they had been denied it uh, for far, far too long. So I, I want to thank uh, the members of this House uh, from the people of Northern Ireland. But can I also say this? One of the groups that were at the forefront uh, of that campaign and are at the forefront of uh, working with uh, particularly gay and uh, lesbian and, and bisexual women in Northern Ireland are called Here NI, and they're about to have their funding uh, cut. Uh, would the, the, the honourable member agree with me that that cannot be allowed to happen? That the Northern Ireland office and the Northern Ireland executive have to do everything <coughs> in their power to protect that vital service? And one of the key things that they do is look after uh, the mental health uh, of uh, lesbian uh, people. Uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. Yeah. It cannot be allowed to happen. Yeah. I thank the Honourable Member for, for giving way and agree with everything that he said. I was proud to vote for equal marriage in Northern Ireland um, and for abortion reform. Uh, it was a strange position to be in. I, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. And, and, and I abstained on a number of occasions to give the you know, Stormont the opportunity to get back up and running, but was always very clear if it didn't. That, and, and, and members there wanted, and people there wanted it to happen, that 
it, it, would, it would seem there, there was no, no other option. And so I was very, very proud to support that legislation and, and, and see that happen. And I pay tribute, as he does, uh, to the many people who fought so hard to make that happen. Uh, the thought that funding would be pulled is hugely concerning, and I agree with everything he says on that front. And, and what I would say is that we, we know that legislative change does not in itself necessarily change culture or fix the problems, but it's an important step. And we all remember Section 28, and as it was Section 2A in Scotland, and how hugely damaging those discriminatory pieces of legislation were uh, to uh, LGBT people, not just then, but now. And I saw someone online recently say that because someone, uh, one of my colleagues, wasn't around when that legislation, wasn't even born when that legislation came into force, that how could it possibly affect <coughs> her? What an outrageous and ridiculous thing to suggest. I did not have to fight for the equality that I now have, but I certainly felt the effects of the discrimination uh, that that late legislation left behind, as do and have many people. And we are only working, we are only getting now uh, the inclusive education that we should have had when that legislation was uh, repealed uh, in Scotland and across the UK. In Scotland, we are working with uh, Time for Inclusive Education, the Equality Network, and Stonewall, um, the Trans Alliance, and other organisations. But Ty have been very much at the forefront of making sure that our government in Scotland rolls out inclusive education. I started school the year that legislation came into force, and it was hugely damaging. And I know that this gov UK government has also said it is, is rolling out uh, inclusive education, and I hope that it stays true to that commitment. Uh, because we have to be absolutely resolved and determined to make sure that those changes happen. This is not about necessarily uh, the details of sex of LGBT people. It is just about teaching children and young people that LGBT people exist, that some people have two mums, some people have two dads, some people have one mum, some people have one dad, some people have a mum and a dad, some people are brought up by uh, kinship carers in care by grandparents. The, the, the family makeup uh, across the UK is and has been for many years uh, very, very varied, and we should welcome and celebrate that. Now, healthcare appointments, Madam Deputy Speaker, I know from my own experience, can be throw up unexpected issues. Uh, a smear can be, for many people, a very difficult uh, and distressing thing. For most people, it will be fairly straightforward. And I'd like at this stage to mention the My Body Back Clinic, which is LGBT inclusive and provides specialist services for survivors of rape. Uh, domestic abuse and sexual violence. Um, a number of years ago, when I was getting one of my first smears after coming out, I went uh, to my local service and the nurse, wrongly assuming I was heterosexual, asked what contraception I used. Well, I, when I explained, well, for a start, I'm a lesbian, um, her eyebrows went up and she looked a bit awkward and said, oh, well, you won't need any then, and, and sort of brushed over the matter. Now, that unfortunately was a wrong assumption, because lesbian and bi people do need and should be considering protection during sex. Now, I, I'm going to get into some detail here, Madam Deputy Speaker. I hope it doesn't make anybody feel too awkward. If it does, perhaps that begs the question of why it makes people feel awkward and how important it is to discuss these issues. Um, there are really important issues around this that are not uh, broadly uh, or widely discussed. And safe sex for lesbians and bi, couple, uh, bi and trans people, and, in, and indeed non-binary people, are very, very important, particularly around oral sex and sharing of sex toys. If you or your partner have had or have or suspect you have an STI or an STD. Now, it seems that the nurse that saw me was not appraised of these matters, sadly, um, but it is important that we remember that we still live in a very heteronormative society and it is not just heterosexual couples that need to make sure they use protection against pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. And, you know, these include washing and the sterilisation of sex toys, but also the use of items such as dental dams. Now, for those of you who may be less well educated and not know what a dental dam is, let me explain. It acts as a barrier uh, to prevent sexually transmitted infections passing from one person to another. 
It does sound like something you would you know, use when you're having your teeth polished. But in fact, uh, and it was originally made for dentistry uh, and, and used to protect the mouth when, when dental work was being done, so not too far from the truth. Um, they are now used uh, in, in protection for uh, lesbian by sex. So thinner versions were apparently later produced, especially for promoting safe or oral sex. Now, if you have ever tried to buy a dental dam, they are not anywhere near as readily available as condoms. In fact, quite often you have to order them off the internet, and frankly, they're not particularly uh, necessary. I don't want to put people off, but nice or attractive things to use. And it is interesting to note the huge innovation and investment that has been put into the development of condoms over the years to make them thinner for maximum pleasure. You get them ribbed, you get them dented, you get them flavoured, you get all sorts. Dental dams don't quite come in the same range. And that is, you know, I would imagine, for a variety of reasons. Um, I mean, the manufacturers and the marketers haven't even seen fit to rename them. Rename them. So I think that's a, a really important point and something that, that you know, is little discussed. And we know also how much women's bodies are impacted by contraception, the toxins that many of us put in our bodies, whether uh, it's the implant, the pill, uh, the coil. I was just discussing one of my colleagues there, the, you know, the impact that putting those toxins in our bodies have. So, so much of our sexual health is centred around heterosexual male pleasure, um, with heterosexual or bi women bearing the brunt of the responsibility when it comes to contraception. There is a, con a common misconception that oral sex is safe, explains Simone Taylor, who is education and regional lead at the Brooke Sexual Health Charity for Young People. But while you can't get pregnant from oral sex, you can still catch an STI. Now, in 2008, Stonewall published findings of a study into the health of 6,000 lesbian and bisexual women, which revealed half of those who had been screened had an STI, and a quarter of those with STIs had only had sex with women in the last five years. So it's very, very important that we recognise those issues. Now, moving on, and I've only got a few more points to make, Madam Deputy Speaker. I know there's a number of other people looking to speak. Um, in terms of uh, disabled people uh, who are also LGBT, uh, they have often had their specific health needs overlooked by healthcare professionals. And Stonewall has written some really compelling briefings on this. They tell us how... Uh, disabled people in the LGBT community it can leave them with a lack of trust in their healthcare provider. Multiple needs are often not taken into account, which affects some of the most vulnerable people. They are not necessarily open about their sexual orientation and or gender identity when seeking medical help because of fear of unfair treatment and invasive questioning. Um, now, th they go on to talk specifically about issues around uh, uh, PIP assessments, and they have, they have said um, one in five non-binary people and LGBT disabled people have experienced um, uh, uh, discrimination, and similarly one in five black, Asian and minority ethnic LGBT people, including 24 per cent of the Asian LGBT people, have experienced this. One of the testimonies they offer uh, is around when someone was going for their PIP assessment. And they say, uh, I held out my hand to shake and the nurse didn't look at myself or my wife after I introduced who she was, had no eye contact with, with me throughout the interview. We felt we wanted to leave. Someone else uh, who shared a testimony said, an NHS nurse asked about my recent gender reassignment surgery and then went on to compare me to being a paedophile as if being trans is the same thing. Now, that was somebody in the east of England, and that, I have to say, I mean, this was taken from Stonewall's website, is hugely uh, concerning. In terms of LGBT, and that is, I think, um, reinforces the point about LGBT education and why it is so incredibly important that's, that those, um, you know, the misinformation that is out there and is being used against trans people uh, is, is busted. And I'm happy. Right. I'm extremely grateful for her giving way. I think she's giving an incredibly powerful and informative speech. I've certainly learned a lot up until this point. I thank her for that. Um, but this point about intersectionality is, I think, incredibly important. And uh, I, the point she makes around SRE education and how important it is that it's delivered in schools is well made. But would she agree with me that it's now also time that we remove the exemption for some families to remove their children, particularly in primary schools, 
of uh, relationship education, age-appropriate relationship education, um, because head teachers who have to deliver this tell me that this is a big barrier uh, and puts them up against their parent bodies, and we need to make that stop and help people help themselves. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with the Honourable Lady. And in fact, what we know is that it is sometimes some of the most vulnerable children who are being taken out of schools who need that relationship education. Um, and that is causing huge issues. And, you know, as we know, there are, are many LGBT young people who, for various reasons, whether it's their parents taking them out of school or, or schools not yet providing that education, um, are, are suffering. Uh, and are suffering profoundly. I think about my own sex education at high school. I mean, it was literally putting a condom on a banana and, and a quick discussion about the pill, and that was it. I mean, it's frightful to think that that is what children were being taught, and we have come a long way, but there is still a long way yet to go. And the, the, the work that Time for Inclusive Education are doing and organisations like Pink Saltire in Scotland is hugely important. And in 2019, Ty delivered 41 education sessions across Scotland, um, uh, working with 85% uh, of the pupils they, they worked with previously held negative views or had a negative attitude towards LGBT peers, uh, reported that their opinions had changed positively after Ty delivered a session. And I've seen some of the, the materials and been involved with some of the materials that Ty have produced. And the, the, the work that they are doing is not just around um, sexuality, but it's also around harmful gender stereotypes, which has a hugely negative impact. And the learning outcomes highlighting that all young people have an improved understanding of challenging these stereotypes, being true to themselves and speaking up if they are struggling. Some of the testimonies they shared with me. An S1 pupil. To never, I learned to never bottle anything up, to speak to someone about problems. I learned no matter how bad things are, it can get better if you try. I learned it's okay to ask for help, that you shouldn't be afraid of who you are. I learned that it's okay to be a bi girl and that things will get better. I learned that it's fine to be LGBTQ plus as a lesbian. I have felt a lot better about myself after this. And a poster created by pupils in Primary 7 reads, Girls can play football, we're all equal. I couldn't agree with that more, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, I just want to, in closing, say how grateful I am to members of this place, uh, to the Speaker uh, and to the House authorities. Uh, when I recently suffered um, homophobic abuse, it's the only way to describe it, from a member of the other place. I, I named him at the time. I'm not going to name him again. Um, but uh, what a profound impact that has had on my mental health and also you know, the support that I've had from the police. And I still, it's the first time I ever experienced that kind of discrimination in my workplace. I think we all know that there are workplaces across the UK where LGBT people are facing discrimination. <coughs> But to have experienced it in such an acute way for a member of the House of Lords to say homophobic things about me in the press was just and is still something that I find utterly incredible. There is not very much I can say about it because the matter is ongoing. But I do want to say how grateful I am to the members from all political parties who supported me and contacted me, and also the people, people in, in the public. Um, the, the member who in question uh, is a former uh, MP from Northern Ireland and now sits as a life peer in the House of Commons. And I actually got a number of emails from people in the Northern Ireland LGBT community telling me the damage that he had done to their community over many decades. I didn't know who he was before I came across him. Um, just on that, I appreciate um, the, the members uh, shock and revulsion at, uh, revulsion at the comments that, that were made. Can I stress they are very much unrepresentative of Northern Ireland uh, of today? And hopefully, between um, my colleague from Foyle and South Belfast and myself, we're putting forward a different face of Northern Ireland that, uh, around uh, these type of, of debates. Um, however, many people in Northern Ireland have suffered, as the member has, has, has indicated, on the, on the brunt of similar such comments, including from that member in the past and indeed others. But hopefully, we are turning the page in that regard. Yeah. I thank the Honourable Member for his intervention. I couldn't agree more. I have a deep affection and many, many friends in Northern Ireland. I have spent a lot of time there. And when I had, was getting emails from people saying, 
you know, we're so sorry, and this person doesn't represent us. I, I knew that, but um, nonetheless, I was heartbroken to hear of the profound impact that this individual had had on uh, the LGBT community in, in Northern Ireland. But putting that to one side, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm glad that we've had the debate. Uh, we're having this debate today. I hope. Uh, you know, that all members will agree there is still a long way to go and that having debates like this are part of that picture in making sure that uh, there is good and proper health care for everybody in the LGBT community and that we as members do everything we can to make sure that no one suffers poor mental or physical health just because of their gender, their sexuality, their gender identity, uh, because we are all equal and at the end of the day we're all human.